welcome, welcome, welcome to the Wild Yoga Tribe podcast. I'm your host, Lily Allen Duenas. Together, we'll talk about the world of yoga and we'll talk to people from around the world. Before diving into the episode, I wanted to invite you to head on over to my Patreon. It's brand new, newly minted, bright and shiny, and I would love your support. I'm thrilled to be launching this online community space where we can do yoga together, meditate together, and you'll get access to exclusive content. Get ready for some private Zoom Q&As, free printable art, meditation recordings, and more. Follow the link in the bio to get started. Ready to dive in? Let's go. Namaste, family, and welcome back to the Wild Yoga Tribe podcast. Today, today I'm so excited to be joined by Liva Vernberger. She is a yoga teacher from Latvia, and I know I didn't pronounce her name 100% correctly, so hopefully she can correct me here in a minute, but I wanted to introduce her as the studio owner of Urban Yoga in Riga, Latvia. So Liva first came to yoga around 15 years ago when she was seeking a deeper, more fulfilling practice. She found Hatha yoga and Anasura yoga first, and then was introduced to Ashtanga Vinyasa yoga, which has become an integral part of her life ever since. So after learning Ashtanga yoga in 2012, um, when she was a full-time lawyer, she did a yoga teacher training. She then was feeling dissatisfied with her career in law, and she took some time off to actually go to New Zealand and then do a yin yoga teacher training. So I'm so excited to hear more about Leva from her about her journey, about all she's learned, and I'm just excited to welcome her today. So thank you so much, Leva, for being here with us. Hello, Lily. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I just wanted to say, I think that your podcast idea, like traveling around the yoga studios around the globe, it's amazing. And I really feel happy to be here. And yes, my name is Liva Weinberg. It was quite well pronounced. No problems with that. Thank you. And so for starters, how about we dive into your story? Share with our listeners how yoga first came into your life. Yeah, well, you already said a little intro, which is true about me. I did find yoga when I was looking for something more fulfilling. I did dance. I do love dance also now in my life. I still sometimes flow with breath and dance and then my Ashtanga yoga practice all together. I really love dancing and it gave me this fulfilling feeling into my heart that it's something more beyond just physical. And I also love physical. I used to go to fitness clubs and doing all those things. But then I had to leave the dance because I started my law studies and it just, everything changed in my life and I didn't have my dance. And uh, then I was seeking for something more, full-time work, full-time studying and life happens. And I felt uh, that I need something to calm down. I'm a very vata kind of person. I'm very like active and a lot of emotions and uh, all the things. And I needed something grounding. So at first I did go a lot to fitness clubs, but I felt always it was nice, but there is something empty still in my heart. It doesn't satisfy all my needs. And then somehow I got to yoga class in fitness club. And then I also went to yoga class in yoga studio. And that's the way how I started and my yoga trip, it was uh, some Hatha yoga, some Anusara yoga. In that time, here in Riga, we didn't have all these fancy yoga names right now that we have. We have Ashtanga yoga, Vinyasa flow, core flow, Hatha yoga, Anusara yoga, Yin yoga, Yin yang, and uh, so on. Then it was mostly studio schedules were just yoga. So I even didn't know. I just did yoga. And now when you ask the person, like, what kind of yoga you do? But then it was just, I do yoga, and that was absolutely enough but somehow so I was floating to these yoga classes three times a week as much as I could and I really loved that and it gave me more peaceful feeling and I also of course love the physical challenge so I was seeking for something that gives me physical satisfaction and also emotional satisfaction because I always was active person and then I somehow got into Ashtanga yoga after a few years but we had one teacher here in, in Riga she just came from Mysore India and she did this workshop of Ashtanga yoga and uh, it was like a lead class and I was wow I love it <laughs> because I love this physical but it fulfilled my heart and all the breath and everything. So then I started to do Ashtanga like once a week 
that was maximum we had, one one class in a week. And somehow, slowly, I started to res- research about Ashtanga Yuminyasa Yoga, and uh, slowly it became my most uh, important practice that I'm still practicing. And uh, yeah, that's my story of uh, that, how I found yoga or yoga found me. Yes, I love how it just came so organically. And you're right that back 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, when you said, oh, I practice yoga, that was enough. <laughs> yeah. People weren't yeah. even familiar with that word at all. They'd say, oh, what's yoga? I haven't heard of it. But now it's becoming such a more common word recognized globally. This word is just part of our common vernacular, our lexicon. And I'm grateful that we're able to have these further ways of expressing and understanding what types of yoga there are. Because I do think that certain people, energies, and the way that they live, their lifestyles, like they might need more of the Ashtanga Vinyasa. They might need something more of a flow if they're more Kapha per se, or if maybe more Vata, then they're going to be needing maybe more Yin, just an act of slowing down. So I know I would love to speak with you, Leva, about how Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga and Yin Yoga kind of counterbalance each other or what your understanding or insight is on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree with that, that it's nice that we have these different styles. Of course, they all are yoga and they all have a similar purposes while we're practicing it but for some people in some moment of life one style maybe is more appropriate and then it could change during the lifetime and yeah for me i really love this ashtanga the breath and the strength and stretch and then as a dancer i love that flowing that we have in this vinyasa style i also teach vinyasa and ashtanga vinyasa both of the styles and the connection and the movement I always thought this is my yoga. Ashtanga, I even tried uh, like many years ago. I tried a yin and I really didn't like it. Honestly, first time I thought, oh, that's just like a stretching class. No, I want my active yoga and not just stretching class. But I didn't got the point then of yin class. Now I understand that. Somehow... As you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, that yeah, I used to be full-time lawyer. I, I did actually love what I did. I did the law when I did study, but I just didn't like that lifestyle of being a lawyer, sitting in front of the computer. Even if I did some court cases, it was still a lot of sitting, reading, computer. And I always felt that my life fades away. I was just spending in the office and then I felt my real life is when I finally don't have to be at the work. And I always thought I have to change something, but I didn't know how. And then I just thought, okay, I will do this backpacking trip to New Zealand. You could get this working travel visa. I could also work there. And there I realized that I'm so much water and I'm so active and I need something more grounding. Maybe that's one of the reasons why I feel unsatisfied with my life because I'm just too much energy. In Auckland, I just went to one yoga studio. I don't even remember the class. Probably it was vinyasa, but I saw that they're doing this yin yoga teacher training. And I thought, now I have free time, finally again. I already had my uh, first uh, teacher training certificate. It was in vinyasa style. And I was already teaching yoga. I thought, oh, this is yin yoga. I know it's very slow, maybe not for me, but maybe I need something that could calm me down and maybe it could balance my ashtanga and my dynamic kind of nature. And uh, so I did this yin training. It was uh, divided uh, like 50 hour, 50 hour, 50 hour. So during that year, I could do full training. I did it with um, Karin Michel Sang. And uh, she's uh, she's New Zealander and uh, with Marcus, with her partner. So they're both really amazing teachers. And I, it was mind-blowing. <laughs> my first teacher training in yin, it was like mind-blowing. Like my uh, whole uh, yoga world just turned upside down because before I thought that uh, this uh, yin is not for me. And then I was like, wow, that's amazing. This yin is just amazing because I really understood how it works for my body, how it works for my mind. And uh, I understood how it can actually be combined with my Ashtanga yoga practice because sometimes you can just feel a bit 
tired or not so much energy, your energy is low, so you can work with yin or you can do ashtanga in the morning and yin in the evening to more calmer pace and just work. It, it, I actually think that yin goes together with any style of yoga. So I'm really happy I found yin. I love to teach yin. Of course, Ashtanga yoga is my love forever. It's my yoga love. But uh, I think yin is available for maybe even more people. And nowadays, a lot of people have this burned out or they just feel too much stress, too much emotions. And sometimes it's a good way how to start with the yin practice. I also have some uh, yogis who started the older people, people above 60 years old. They started with yin. And then after one year of yin practice, they finally feel confident in their body. And they are like, oh, maybe I can try something a bit more active. And then they're ready, for example, for hatha yoga. And I think that's an amazing way for some people have to get into yoga, to start with yin and then slowly start to feel their body and the breath and they're ready for something else so i love them both i think they are like amazing balance and uh, it's for everyone yin practice everyone can do it yes yin is so accessible so approachable and i love how you also mentioned it's something that's really great to calm the mind and calm the body down in the evenings before bed i really find that yin is a great evening practice as well as the first thing in the morning when i'm feeling stiff and, and creaky and maybe depending on the season I feel lower energy so it's just such a nice practice to be able to cherish the body and nurture the body and be with it, be with ourselves um, more mindfully. And I definitely want to ask you, Leva, what is the, one of the most powerful lessons you've learned from yoga, either as a student of yoga or as a yoga teacher? Oh, that's, such a, that's such a good question. And honestly, it's, uh, it's hard to say. There is not one thing that I would say that's the most powerful because I practice yoga for quite a long time already. And I can just say that it's not only physical <laughs> practice and it's not only spiritual. It's so many things. And I think the powerful lesson as a yoga student is that you just can't even imagine what you can find into yourself, into your body, what kind of strength you can find. And I don't mean only like physical strength, also emotional strength, or like how you can change yourself to become a better person. We all already are good persons and we can just show it to the outer world. We can start to shine with the help of this practice. Another story, like being a yoga student and yoga teacher, is just two, two, two different stories and two different lives. But as a teacher, I think working with people, I have understood that you never cannot judge person from the first time you meet or what you know about the person from others or from the publics or how you think about the person from the first time because it's so beautiful when you work um, in yoga shala with that person and you somehow start to get to know the person into their practice and I think each person has something really nice within themselves and you can learn so much beautiful things about the people. So I really love that exchange of energy that we can have during the practice as a teacher. Of course, also with the other yogis when you're practicing. But uh, yeah, that's uh, what we can learn as a teacher is that each person is individual and a beautiful person. And you just need maybe sometimes time to get to know them as a teacher and the student relationships, but it could be really beautiful. Yes, yes. Everybody is completely unique. And I think that remembering that our biology and our biography are all so different is key as a yoga teacher and as a yoga student. It helps remove some of the ego of the practice and some of those aesthetic expectations, or we'll even say anatomical expectations, because I know... Uh, Bernie Clark, who is the author of a lot of yin yoga books, he makes that good point about biology and biography. And if we go in with expectations of, oh, you're, you definitely will, your knee will definitely be tracking more outwards in this pose. Well, some people's anatomy just isn't quite that way. So I love the, how humbling I think yoga can be as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, love, I think it was Bernie's book where he's, the name of the book is Your Body, Your Yoga. 
I just love that because it's your body, it's your yoga. Each body is different. And also in Ashtanga and in Yin Yoga, in every yoga, it's your body and it's your yoga. Don't look to others. Don't look to these beautiful, fancy pictures, how people do the practice. It's your body. So it's your yoga. It doesn't matter what other people do around you. You have to listen to yourself. Oh, absolutely. And there's actually a famous quote by James Audubon, and that's um, he's a very famous bird watcher and the bird book author. And his quote is, if the bird and the book disagree, believe the bird. <laughs> so I think that's true as well. In the books of yoga and all of the texts and all of the understanding, the anatomy, if the book says something, but your body tells you something different, believe your body. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So That's beautiful. We- Yeah. And Leva, I was also curious about when you were backpacking in New Zealand and you did that yoga teacher training, as well as the yoga training you did in Ashtanga, would you like to share more about what those two trainings were like? Yeah, my first teacher training, it was in Latvia, in Riga. I actually never thought I would become a yoga teacher. I didn't really have a plan. But as I said, in that times, we had yoga in the schedules of the yoga studios. It was yoga and that's it. And then I think it was like five years of practice uh, or four, I already practiced yoga on and off. And I thought I want to get a deeper knowledge of this. And I just saw that they started this teacher training in Riga and I could combine it quite well with my job schedule because I was then full-time office worker. But I never thought I would become a really yoga teacher because I thought I could not probably earn with yoga. I could not probably combine with my full-time law job. So I just took my first training actually as a student who wanted to know more about yoga. And uh, this was uh, more like a vinyasa hatha based. It was not a shtanga. And uh, it was uh, like all Latvians there in the training. And then after this training, I got this first uh, chance to teach. Someone just offered me because they knew that I did the training and just offered the time after my work that I could combine. And I was like, okay, I have the certificate. So maybe I can start teaching, even though I never thought I would do it. And so then I did start to teach twice a week, Monday, Wednesday evenings <laughs> at seven o'clock in the evening after my law job. So it was funny. I just left my office and I ran to the yoga studio in my office fancy clothes. I'm like, hello, <laughs> let's have yoga. And but I really love those evenings and I, I just really love them. And I still have some clients who did did come to me this 10 years ago and they still come to me. It's so beautiful. So it was my first training. And then, of course, I did um, all these kind of workshops, uh, abroad workshops out from the Riga. And then I started to follow my Ashtanga yoga teacher. My main teacher is Lino Miela from Italy. But I did go to him uh, also to India and to Italy. I still keep going and uh, met him first in Estonia. He came to our neighbor country and then... um, I just fall in love with this Meister style method. I was, I still remember my first class in Kovalam in India where Lino is uh, practicing in his shala teaching and I was like wow it's amazing because so far I did only this lead style and then I went to Meister practice and I was of course confused, a bit afraid how it will be and I just went in that class and it was all mess because everyone was doing something else. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what's happening here? But that's how the master class has to be. But the breath, the Ujjayi breath, and I was like, wow, I want to be part of that. And then ever since, it's my true love in my yoga practice. So I'm following uh, this teacher and I'm following um, his method when I teach Ashtanga yoga. And then this yin training, which I did in New Zealand, it was so different than my first training because, first of all, it was in New Zealand. So it was all in English and it was all those people from New Zealand or from Australia, some people. And it was so amazing. (laughs) Those people I met there, they, I think, made the integral part of the training because there was people in every age and in older ladies, but that yin training was just amazing. And it was so different for me also because I already was teacher with experience. I already did teach yoga and I could see how I can use this when I'm teaching in my teachings, how I can use it for my clients. I could already see, oh, this is interesting. I should remember this because I know I have clients with this kind of issues because in my first training, I didn't think about clients so much. I just wanted to think about, oh, asana 
business and how to explain. And I was even afraid to lead relaxation part. Was, oh my God, that's so weird to let them to relax. While I did my the other trainings, it was just, yeah, I was already a teacher and I could enjoy it and see there those things that could really be useful for me as a teacher. I did love it. I did love the teachers. I did love the people I met there. I did love New Zealand itself. And it was, it was amazing. Yeah. Incredible. So what was it like also, Leva, to open your own yoga studio in Latvia, to open urban yoga? Yeah, coming back from New Zealand, it was it was a bit hard at first because I went there to just have a little kind of... Uh, time off from my lawyer's job and just to understand how to deal with my life afterwards. I wanted to change my life, but I didn't know how to change. So I just ran away to the New Zealand, did some backpacking jobs, ran the ultra marathon there, did this teacher training. I did teach their yoga, but it was just a few classes in this Queenstown area. Then I came back and I, at first, honestly, I was depressed. I'm not the person who is cry- crying a lot, but I was crying almost every day because because I knew that I have to return in my law office job. And I thought, oh my God. So I went there. I had an amazing year. I had an amazing experience. And now I'm going back to my old life. Like, no, no way. But I couldn't figure out how other way I can just live and earn money. And I just had to work. I love to work, but I... I couldn't see myself going back in this full-time law office work. And then um, actually the studio that I'm owner, Urban Yoga, it's the studio where I already started my classes this 10 years ago. The girl who opened Urban Yoga, she also did this training in Latvia and she opened it to 10, oh, it's, it will be 10 years soon. So I am in this studio from the first day it was opened, but for first, so three years, um, there was uh, this girl, Liana. She was uh, the owner of the studio, but I was there already teaching. And then when I came back from New Zealand, I also wrote to her that, yes, I'm back and I would like to teach not only this vinyasa style and ashtanga, but I would love to teach yin because I did learn this yin and I really want to teach also yin yoga. So can we time uh, find some time in the, the schedule of studio so I can do all of those styles and it was summer but then I still didn't write to the law office that I about my returning because I was still crying <laughs> every day about thinking how to live after this beautiful amazing time in New Zealand and then just this girl who opened um, Urban Yoga 10 years ago. She had also a lot of different uh, things in her life and changes in her life. And she said to me that she's actually selling the studio. There was already one girl coming and uh, to the classes and checking out the teachers and so on. And she said she's selling the studio because she just, uh, she wants to teach, but she doesn't want to own studio. It's so much uh, administrative things you have to do and so on. And then I was like, oh, wow, maybe that's my chance not to go back in my law life and maybe that's a good opportunity just to be a full-time yoga teacher even though I didn't know how it will work I was not sure if I could even survive with that financially I of course in my head I had the dream that maybe one day I could own a yoga studio I think as most of the yoga teachers uh, I had this dream oh maybe but I never really thought that it will happen and uh, this offer that she said that she's selling came in that right time because I was already out from my comfort zone I was already spending one year backpacking without a normal life without a, like just the work somewhere here and there but it was very kind of simple life and close to nature I didn't have this salary every month as a lawyer so it was already being out of my comfort zone and I thought why not and that's how I became a York City owner but I was already so teaching in the studio I had maybe my own idea how I would like to change the studio i knew i want to it um, to become more like international because we are teaching classes here also in english language everyone knows that if you're looking for a yoga classes in Riga and english uh, experts or students uh, we have a lot of uh, international students coming to our classes uh, they can come to urban yoga because we will do classes in latin english or just in english depends who comes but like we will make sure that people will understand and of course i also had a dream that maybe one day we could 
have the Ashtanga Yoga Studio. But to be real, in Latvia, in Riga, to survive just teaching Ashtanga Vinyasa, I don't think we could afford even to pay our bills for the shala. I understood that now I have like Hatha yoga and just flow vinyasa yoga and yin yoga styles. But I always knew I want this more or less traditional styles with the Western touch, but still authentic yoga. And I just love my studio. Yeah, I'm super, super happy about this decision that I did. It's actually now it's six years. And since my full-time job is being a yoga teacher and I never, ever regretted, even in the COVID times, which we still have, but like we were, for example, closed for eight months in a row. We couldn't work. I had to work online. It was hard times, but I never, ever regretted that I did the choice. And I, I really love, I, like now my life, and my job is my life it's all together it's my lifestyle being a yoga teacher and that's the best decision I did in my life so far so happy to hear that and I know something also Leva that you're so passionate about is the importance for yoga teachers to have their own self-practice so just teaching yoga isn't your practice but when your day is already filled with yoga it can be hard to come to the mat by yourself or to find that time to show up on the mat Uh, for your own self-practice. So I would love it if you would speak more to our listeners about that. Yeah, that's definitely what I always say to all my yoga teachers who's teaching in my studio, that don't lose your practice. That the thing that you lead classes, even if it's one class per day, even if it's five classes per day, It's not your practice. Your yoga practice is when you connect with your breath, when you connect with your body, when you think about your drishti points, you use your banhas. While you're leading, you still think about your yogis. At least if you are a good teacher, you don't think about yourself. You think about your yogis. Yes, you do some physical movements and you can say you did fitness, you did some sports because you did chaturanga dandasana with them or you did some asana with them to show how the asana looks, but it's not your practice. And to be a good teacher, you have to keep practicing. You have to stay with your practice, never lose it. I always say it to my teachers and I always say it to myself. And uh, it is sometimes hard. I almost always choose my practice because I know I will feel so much better because uh, It's just the integral part of my life. And I think if you want to teach yoga, you cannot lose your practice. You cannot think that you're just doing the classes and doing some movements, that it's your practice. No, it's sport. But if you don't follow your breath, if you don't listen to your body, don't listen to your breath, don't listen to your emotions, it's not your yoga practice. It's very important to stick with that. Your practice, that's super important. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And I have yoga teacher friends who they do self-practice. They do have that time. But instead of it being a self-guided practice, they'll instead exclusively be watching a YouTube video or doing an online yoga class. And why I, I think it's so amazing and important that yoga teachers take classes with other yoga teachers to learn and grow and to observe other styles and get ideas. And that's so important. I also think it's very important to have time where you are following your breath and what your body is calling for, for that day. And that's, that's only done in silence. Yeah, definitely. It's super important. Now in Ashtanga Yoga, we have this self-practice master style method. So I just with myself, in my breath, and that's it. And uh, I just know my sequence and I work with my sequence and that's my integral part and that's how I practice. But when I go in traveling somewhere, I just love when I travel also to see how it's in that country, the yoga, and feel that the yoga unites all of us. And I love to go sometimes to some uh, vinyasa or hatha class because it helps you really, as you said, as a teacher. One thing is you can learn something new, you can feel something new, but you can also understand, oh, the teacher like did this and that. You can learn from each teacher something. And sometimes you can maybe notice some things that kind of annoys you and you think, oh, I hope I don't do this. I wouldn't like to do that in my class. So you can always learn for, from each teacher something. And it's very useful. Yeah, very useful to do that. Yeah. And so, Leva, what is your personal definition of yoga? I know there's sutras and there's things that we can quote back to, but I would love to hear what your definition of yoga is. 
Yeah, it's it's such a good question because I think you can define yoga. There's so many ways. For example, I'm also a lecturer. I do lectures in in a university here in Riga, and I do teach yoga. It's elective course. It's it's either physiotherapists or fitness trainers who can have this course. It's called fitness yoga, even though in my first in my first lecture I said I'm not a fitness yoga teacher and I don't really know what is fitness yoga because that's not a yoga style. I'm just uh, teaching them about yoga yoga styles and the methods so they can understand it's like a lactic course there i'm teaching and i have a i think four or five slides where it, what explains what is yoga <laughs> so there is really so many definitions and what i wanted to say with that that there's not wrong definition as long as a person sits and think about it they can find so many different definitions and all of them could be right but to I think it could also change during your lifetime but for now I think for me my personal definition for yoga is that it's the source of my strength it's a source of both my inner and my outer strength it's the source for my physical and emotional strength and it's like the union that helps uh, for me to connect with myself that yoga is definitely def- defined as a union so for me it's really union that helps to connect with myself and it helps to gain an intimate relationship with uh, my body with the breath with mind with emotions and then this intimacy with uh, myself is the one that leads toward uh, some self-confidence and some comfort with myself as a human being. It helps me to understand better why I'm here and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And yeah, that's the source of the strength in a wider meaning. That's for me. That's beautiful. And is there something that you think people are getting wrong about yoga? I know that you're saying you're lecturing and about fitness yoga and you're laughing like, that's not actually a yoga. So is there something that in, you've noticed that you feel people are getting wrong about yoga? There's two things. That, well, one, one thing is that people say, oh, it's just for girls or oh, it's just some stretch and it's nothing serious. And that's a very typical. Ah, oh, yeah, it's for girls to go and stretch and have some fun and drink some cacao, which is absolutely wrong that's one thing but i wanted to mention also maybe not what people getting wrong about yoga but there is this kind of thinking also that you know a lot of yoga in western world is very not even ashtanga vinyasa which is at least traditional style but all this flow this and flow that and like very physical practice and then some people think that yoga is only this physical part that there is uh, nothing else. Oh, yeah, maybe some breathing, but uh, yeah, it's asanas. And uh, of course, we all, we yoga teachers know it's not only physical, it's so much more. But at the same time, I don't like that people say that it's so wrong when people think that they come to yoga to do a physical movement. I think it's actually beautiful. There is so many reasons why people come to yoga. Each person can have their own reason why they practice yoga, why they started the yoga. And I think if we do asana practice together with the breath, you still do beautiful yoga practice. And with this physical practice, connecting with the breath, connecting with these trishti points, you can affect your mind, you can affect your nerve system. So I think it's just normal that people here in the Western world maybe start their practice with more physical, but then they understand that the physical asanas can change your body, clean your body, and it change your mind. I don't like when there is this trend saying that, no, yoga is not physical, it's something else. You got it wrong if you think it's only asanas. Of course, it's wrong if you think it's only asanas. But asanas is important part. And I think for us, for the people in the Western world, when they're sitting so much in the office or sitting so much in car, and when their lifestyle is not so active, I think it's actually the best way how to start it. And then they notice how their mind changes, how their body changes. And then slowly their body finally will be ready for the meditation practice and for deeper pranayamas. Because if the person like this comes, for example, imagine a person who is working in the office, sitting all day and they have back pain. And then they would come and say, oh, I come to yoga because I want to sit for two hours and meditate. <laughs> and say, yeah, really? Maybe at first you don't have to sit two hours and meditate. You have to start to move so you feel better in your body. There is no pain. 
you gain this connection with your mind, body, and all the things that we talk about in yoga. And then after years, that person will be ready to sit and meditate for two hours. And I also said to my students that when you see asana as a picture, like a beauty, we have full uh, Google and uh, YouTube with the pictures of asana. But it's only picture that you can see. There's something more happening beyond that picture because in the picture you cannot show breath which is integral part in this practice. You cannot show banha practice. You cannot show drishti practice. You cannot show the concentration. So into asana, we include this all. And if you include this all, it's already yoga. And I think it's beautiful that people maybe start with the physical practice, which includes this all, and then slowly their mind will also change. They will get calmer, more peaceful, or they will just get from yoga all what is needed. So there is not wrong reasons why to do yoga. I think if someone is ready to try yoga, it's a perfect reason, whatever is the reason. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more, Leva. That's so perfectly said because the asana can be the gateway to learning different aspects of yoga. It's often that people come to the whole path of yoga through that gateway of asana. So when people look down on it or, as you said, just say, oh, it's just such a small part. Yes, that's true. But I do think that we need to honor and celebrate and acknowledge the role that asana has globally in bringing people to the path of yoga. Yeah, absolutely. So, Leva, also, I'd love to talk a little bit more about Latvia, about your country. What is yoga like in Latvia? Yeah, so, of course, it's it's more popular than it was when I did it, when I started it this 15, approximately 15 years ago. So, when I started, it was just few yoga studios. And as I said, it was mostly yoga. So, then, yes, there was not so many studios. And, of course, during these years, it got more popular, more studios, more teachers and also more understanding about yoga as I said 15 years ago if people asked me so do you do some sports or something I said yeah I do running and I do yoga and it was enough and now when you say I do yoga there is a question what kind of yoga (laughs) it's all they at least know there is different styles of yoga I think that already shows that it had more popular and uh, about the yoga studios uh, and I think uh, in such a small city as Riga is it's we, we are quite a small country and I think that's a easier way how to survive as a yoga studio uh, because if you offer only one specific style I think it's harder to have more and more yogis and uh, just keep them coming to your yoga studio And if they can just come to the same studio, meet the same people, they still feel invited. So it's like that. And I think more and more people, of course, have tried yoga, but it's still a lot of misunderstanding uh, for sure. I think I still have friends who don't understand what I'm doing. They just think maybe that I'm sitting and breathing. And then they maybe check out my Instagram and they were like, oh, wow, that looks hard. (laughs) And they they start to realize, okay, it's something more than just sitting and meditating. Or then uh, there are people who think it's just sports, like a physical practice. And uh, yeah, but uh, I think people get more and more open, but I still hear a lot of excuses like, oh, it's just for females. But I love that in my yoga studio, we have uh, quite a lot of male practitioners and I love the balance between both energies. And I think in last years, there's more and more male practitioners And what I love, there is more and more older people coming. I think when I started, and especially Ashtanga Yoga, there were just the youngsters, 20, 30 years old. I think no older people, maybe 40 was maximum. And now I get people coming above 60 years old, even 70 years old. We even have a yoga teacher who is 70 years old. She's teaching Kundalini Yoga, but she started her yoga practice with me. I think it was six years ago she started in yoga with me and then she slowly started some hatha and then she found kundalini and it's so beautiful that people in every age do practice more and more yoga yeah that's how it's here incredible a 70 year old yoga teacher let's always celebrate that always (laughs) yeah that's amazing i think that's just great yes and so how about can we talk for a minute here about what latvia is like as a country in case some of our listeners don't know too much about it could you share more about latvia with us 
It's a small country in Europe. We are a member state in European Union. I would say that we are just a normal European country. <laughs> uh, of course, we are more northern country, so uh, people here in Latvia is more uh, like not so open with the emotions, more closed, uh, more northern type, like Scandinavian type. But of course, in our history, we had an uh, impact also from uh, from Russia. So we have this mixture. We had impact from Russia, from Scandinavia, from Germany. So we can see from those cultures something into our culture. So we are the northern European country. And uh, we gained uh, our independence from Soviet Union into 1991. Of course, you can't compare Latvia with those uh, countries who were independent for a much longer time. But I think we're doing uh, quite well. And uh, I really love my country. But Latvians have this kind of thing that they always compare Latvia with the other countries and mostly with the other countries that are doing better in the, some in the magazines when they compare in some fields like education or salaries. So they always compare like, oh, yeah, again, we are worse than this and that. That's some kind of thing that Latvians are doing. But I think actually we are a very nice place where to live. And we have beautiful nature. We have four Four seasons, like really winter, spring, summer and autumn. But the one thing I don't like about my country that much is that we have so long winters and so much dark seasons. Like some, we, now we have summer. It's amazing. It's all green. It's so light. And the summer is the best time for me as a water person, for me. I, but you just have to dig a bit deeper and you can find really brilliant people here. And uh, yeah, it's a nice country. Amazing. Thanks so much for sharing more about it. And also just for the entire beautiful conversation we've had today. I'm so grateful. And if anyone wants to reach out to you, Leva, I'm going to put your information, your website, and your Instagram social profiles in the show notes, as well as on my website, wildyogatribe.com. But do you want to tell our listeners verbally where they can find you too? Yeah, sure. Uh, and I would be happy if someone uh, joined our classes because, as I said, we do classes in English, a lot of classes in English. So we have the webpage is uh, urbanyoga.lv. That's a webpage. And, of course, I think in know there's a lot of uh, foreigners just write us on Instagram or Facebook so they can find my studio, Urban Yoga, underneath the name Urban Yoga Riga. And my Instagram is Leva Vane, like my name and the first part of my surname. And also in the Facebook, we are Urban Yoga Riga. Anyone can uh, write there if they have any questions, if they ever come to Riga, want to practice Ashtanga, Yin or Flow, or just maybe want to have advice about the yogic uh, places in Riga where to enjoy some food. I'm always happy to share. I really, like I myself love traveling and I really love when people come to my country and I really love them to share some advices, especially for yogis, because of course it's not so many places for yogis and I have my favorite places. So I'm really happy to share with that. Thank you so much, Leva, for being with me here today. It's been a joy to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting Lily. It was really a lovely conversation and I really think that your podcast is amazing and uh, I will uh, probably slowly listen all of the conversations because it's so amazing to meet the teachers from uh, all around the world and that's a really nice idea to do it and thank you for a chat and uh, yeah, I wish you all the best. Namaste to the listeners and hope to see you all someday on a yoga mat. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Wild Yoga Tribe podcast. My conversation with Liva Vanberger, a yoga teacher from Latvia, was so powerful as we took a deep dive into the world of Ashtanga, Vinyasa Yoga, and Yin Yoga, and how they can be a counterbalance for each other. I loved that we also talked about the power of the asana being a gateway into the practice and why it's important for yoga teachers to have their own self-practice. As a full-time yoga teacher and studio owner in Latvia, Leva sure had so much beautiful insight to share. Thank you for listening to the Wild Yoga Tribe podcast. Be well. Thank you for the gift of your attention today. If you feel called, please share this episode with someone who you think could benefit from it. Leaving a review would also be so appreciated.
I also hope you can join me online on my website, wildyogatribe.com, or on social media. I would love to get to know you better. I would love to share with you and to hear your thoughts. Send me a DM, send me a note, get in touch. It would be great to hear from you. And as always, be well, dear one, be well. Thank you.